from episode 12, Andrew Mears. Are there things that you know, you're, a, you're a continual learner, somebody that's, you know, never stopped learning. Are there books or podcasts out there that you listen to on a regular basis or a book you've read recently that you would uh, recommend for people? Uh, yeah, I'm reading a book at the moment called How Not to Give a Shit. <laughs> really good book, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you look, I, 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 don't re- I, don't read, I don't read a lot of sort of management books and things like that. Um, I've read all the usual sort of startup things, you know, lean yeah. startup, and uh, uh, and and that's that's been great. Um, I, I've uh, I I, t- uh, I like going to meetups, especially at the start, just being part of the local ecosystem, connecting with events and contributing. Yeah. So being um, being able to sort of put yourself out there and do that pitch when it was the scariest thing in the world, you know, those really uh, create so many great learning opportunities. And then um, any podcasts or any any other things you use from an educational perspective? Or blogs? Um, yeah, I, I um, you know I follow I follow you know just in general, you know I, I get my my weekly crunch base report. It's great to see what's actually happening. You yeah. know, follow the money. Usually tells you where things are happening, um, uh, as well as sort of the domain, uh, you know, domain media. Yeah. Um, Renew economy is great in a, for the Australian context here in Australia. That's, mate, that's good. And yeah, I actually, may mention it there. Just some d- domain specific content is always mm-hmm. uh, valuable, right? Yeah. Find out what else is going on. Get out of your own bubble sometimes, which is uh, helpful. Any other education things outside of that that you personally you use? Yeah, I think, um, you know, myself, uh, from my education, it's, it's, as a CEO, you can kind of get wrapped up into the, the daily business <laughs> kind of admin, I guess, and yeah. the strategy and the running and putting fires out. Um, it's kind of what you do. Um, so I think, you know, being staying ahead of the, the market is always important or at least trying to. Um, so, you know, look, I'm on LinkedIn a lot and not from just shouting about myself or the company um, but just trying to, to see if there's some some good articles out there some good learning I think that what I call snippet learning um, you know that quick five minute 20 minute read um, so important um, I have chosen around about 10 specific content blogs to follow uh, religiously in the startup world you know I've got profit well who uh, analyze pricing um, they do a, a pricing tear down every every week um, and that might be let's say for example uh, you know slack versus uh, hip chat for example and they'll do a pricing you know tear down and look at you know how it stacks up and 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 for me that's a seven minute video that can be hugely beneficial uh, looking at pandadoc versus you know docusign for example and just looking at how they're structuring their pricing their product um, so I call that snippet learning. I take advantage of that whenever I can. Um, so, you know, l- learning through essentially someone notifying you and saying, hey, here's a piece of content that's going to be really valuable. Yeah. It's going to take maybe five minutes of your time. Yeah. Um, and it's probably going to add a whole bunch of value to my strategic level. Yeah. Um, so I, I probably pass that on to the team as well. So then we kind of share that out to our team. And I think other team members are, are, are watching design blogs and, and are watching marketing blogs and, and kind of, I guess, there's so much content out there um, that just being open to spending that time every day and not just focused on the business but actually focused on, well, how do I improve this business? I don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly don't. So yeah. how can I glean that information from, um, you know, another source that's doing this? Uh, you know, and then being able to evaluate whether it's good info or bad info. <laughs> that's, that's a second challenge, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, so specific blogs, um, which ones would you recommend for other people? Yeah, so look, I, I, I guess in the SaaS world where we live, um, you know, there's things that we look at every day. Pricing is one of them. Um, pricing has such a big impact on your monthly recurring revenue growth and uh, the, the amount of cost of acquisition. And we, we just something you have to look at every day. So ProfitWell um, is a company that their content marketing is spot on. They, they are analyzing and, and really providing helpful information. I haven't got their service. I don't, <laughs> you know, I haven't bought their, their service, but their content is so strong. That if they if they write me an email, it's the one of the four hundred that I that I open. Um, if that makes sense. So for those guys, um, you know, they're they're making really strong content. I think that's smart from them, but it's also very helpful. Um, just, just I think it's Lemkin. I think he um, he runs Sasta. It's the biggest. 
kind of SAS uh, conference in the world uh, held in San Fran. I was able to go last year. He has a uh, text message alert blog, which is kind of interesting. I'm sure they're collecting all sorts of data off the people that they <laughs> – but, uh, well, you know, the same thing. If he puts out an article about investment, you know, wh- whether he's seeing uh, early stage B businesses or st- stage A businesses getting 10 or 15 mil equity and he kind of throws out a lot of – uh, what we call investment chat that I that I need to be aware of, yeah. um, then I'll be I'll be again reading that one. So there's certain I guess people influences in the business that um, you can identify that certainly are doing what they're saying, uh, yeah. and then also talking about that. So we kind of leverage that. Um, and I think uh, yeah, from from the team perspective, I think there's just a number like HubSpot chucks out a lot of good content. Um, you know, we have one called e learning industry in our space. Uh, which we appear on a lot and we also get a lot of value out of. They're kind of writing a lot of articles about what's happening in the training sector. Um, So I think it's just about a matter of finding which one works for you. Um, But I like the ones that hit me uh, (laughs) rather than necessarily kind of uh, sessional. Uh, Yeah. And it's something we've uh, kind of recently thought about in our platform, you know, how do we make sure that uh, the learner doesn't have to be in the platform. You know, they can get that text message and say, hey, there's a 30-second little video that's going to make your job easier today. Here it is, delivered to, to your inbox in your phone or something along those lines. I think that's where learning's going. From episode 14, Cameron Owen. If a dev's, you know, starting out or what you're looking for from an educational perspective, what are you seeing as the best educational resources for devs? So I guess it, there's a couple of different ways uh, a dev profile can be broken down, especially on the platform. One of them is just writing code, and, and so it's the it's the project side of it, um, which is demonstrating your experience and writing software. So the code you're pushing to GitHub and Bitbucket and whatnot. And for me, uh, one of the things I've actually quite liked, especially when you're trying to get onto new technologies, yeah. is um, some of the platforms like uh, Udemy and, and Stack Skills as far as technologies. Um, they're really handy just to jump on. Um, one of the biggest resources, so when I started building this platform, I wanted to jump on uh, a web dev technology that was that seemed to be gaining momentum, and that at the time was Angular. Yeah. And Continuing to grow. Yes. And I think, yeah, I jumped on it just when it became Angular 2. Yeah. Now it's Angular 7 or something. And the that... I then needed a back end, but I didn't want to waste a lot. Like there's only three of us working on this platform yeah. and it was in our spare time. Like we're making money during the day. We're coming home at night. It's like, mm-hmm. it's not 40 hours a week that we're spending on this. Well, it's in some instances it was, but it was like yeah, yeah, 40 hours during the middle afterwards. Of the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted uh, then a back end that uh, was really easy to use that just sort of took care of a lot of things. So um, Firebase popped up. So they're the two web technologies. So going through YouTube and Google, looking around, I found this really good resource called Angular Firebase. There's this guy that was producing free online content. So I guess just a step away from the paid stuff where Udemy and Stack Skills are sort of paid content. I I found that you could also find out really good information just by going through YouTube and looking at tutorials and demos that people were making as well. Yeah. So, and for anyone that's getting into Angular development or Angular and Firebase development, uh, I highly recommend him actually because his content is free and it's excellent. Like he covers everything you need to know to build yeah. a good website. Nice. Mate, there's so much free content out there now. Quality yeah. free content yes, as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Any productivity tools you use on a daily basis? Uh, we use something, well, aside from all the stuff we use to create the things, yeah. um, but our most important tool is called Toggle, which I'm sure there's tons of alternatives to it, but it's basically a time tracking yeah. tool. So whenever it's logging time against the job, yeah. or logging time against business development, or whatever it is that you're doing, um, it's very good to have reporting on those things for the next sprint, say, like how many hours you have left on the job, how many can you allocate, yeah. when do you have to stop doing this and hand over. Yeah. Not that that happens very often, but you know, you have to be aware of these things. Yeah. And so that's a really important one is, it's not like a, it, it is sort of an accountability thing, like where have you spent your time? 
Sure. But it's more for business intelligence. Well, especially when you've got clients, right? And you're charging your, your, well, yeah. your self out. You're not going to know how to charge future clients at how long the project takes. Precisely. So that's happened to us a couple of times where we said, oh, yeah, it'll be this. And then we charge them that. Then it ends up taking twice as long. And we're like, well, we have to wear that now. Okay. So we don't charge by the hour like a lawyer or something. Like no. we say, okay, here's what you're going to pay. Yeah. If it costs us more time to do it, that's okay. okay. That's our fault. Yeah. But you'd be extremely hard in a... Uh, in a situation where you're building bespoke things that you've not mm. done before, right? Well, well now we have like right. over 20 projects on yeah. our belt, so we're getting better. Yeah. <laughs> and plus, uh, having Sam on board really helps. Yeah, you need somebody to keep you accountable. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, outside of obviously your learning, you may mention them. Do you read? Do you listen to podcasts? Is that other educational resources like that you use? I wish I read more, but um, right now I'm kind of stuck to doing audiobooks yeah. and podcasts obviously not that there's anything wrong with that I love, uh, I love uh, absorbing knowledge able. whatever way possible yeah so uh, I'm driving man. somewhere do you, do you do similar stuff I uh, do audible yeah oh yeah audible subscription nice so I think there's about I don't know, 25 books sitting in there probably about you know, about 7 or 8 unread at the moment uh, so or unlistened to but I've got to get your list after this yeah well maybe we'll chip away through that oh, mine are all over the shop okay Heaps of philosophy and stuff like oh, that. I love it's it. just a way of thinking and understanding human behavior and that sort of jazz. I just find that super interesting. I've got a really big stack of DVDs, believe it or not. I need yeah. to have a DVD player to watch them now. <laughs> but um, it's on psychology. It's yeah, like right. the teaching company lecture series, about 12 DVDs long. I'm yeah. about halfway through it. I'm super interested in the sort of finding a flow state and how to do that, right? Like, I find sometimes like I'm working in the middle of the night. Like, <laughs> I think my like, sweet spot's between like 9.30, at night yeah 9 30 at night kids are in bed yep. and i t- open up the laptop and the next thing i know it's 1 a.m oh, or something like that so like, between like i think it's like 10 p.m and 1 a.m is like it's i can just get in this like zone if it's such a thing a flow state or a zone oh, of so course. i'd love to know how to turn that on turn it off my theory on that is that it's because you have no anticipation of distractions Whereas during the day, you might be working away, but there's always that thing of like the phone might ring or someone yeah. might walk yeah. through the door and ask me a question. Whereas at midnight, yeah. that's not going to happen. Do I need to open up my phone and see if there's a little red button for a notification? Exactly. From episode 17, Scott McShane. Is there any, uh, is there any people in particular you would recommend either on Twitter or elsewhere that people should follow for advice? So Simon Wardley, who does the Wardley Maps thing, and uh, Rachel Murphy from Different are both uh, pretty cool thought leaders that interest me at the moment. And uh, I haven't, don't think they've really uh, shared anything bad over the last few weeks. So, nice. yeah, go there. What are those? Maybe they're, they're unknown to me. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Different is a um, consultancy kind of like a, a, it's, it's innovation slash development consultancy, and they've done some. Uh, some pretty cool contributions so nice. sort of worth she, she's the I think the CEO yep. uh, and Simon Wardley does this cool kind of business um, mapping type technique and that's kind of his his main trick but he also has a, a, a pretty good contribution to the to the Twitter sphere and the technical space as well so I'm, I'm finding them interesting at the moment it's worth checking out I definitely might go down the Simon route I think yeah. I'll give him both crap anyway <laughs> have a look. Um, and it's interesting I think as you said I'd Finding other people that are knowledgeable in their space, finding out who they learn from. Yeah. Um, you dig a little bit of that. Not not everything that you love, I'll love and vice versa. But if you if you get things that crack, I think you can do enough scratching of the surface, you'll find the things that you know that you find valuable, right? Yeah. Nice. Mate, outside of the education part, um, your role is obviously a busy one. What do you do from a productivity perspective to you know to keep yourself on target each day, whether it be apps, whether it be routine based? Are there anything that you'd recommend or that you found successful? Uh, so I use Trello pretty religiously to manage my own uh, the sections of my mind. I tend to break it up: one for the things that I can be doing for my team, one for the work that the team and I are doing um, to work on, and another one just more me generally how to organise my tasks. Uh, something that I want to be better at. Uh, I know. I'm, uh, that's one of my sort of development areas about how do I, how do I get better yield out of my time? Uh, it's a, definitely something I'm focused on. I use that. I think I also used um, Mind Node, which is a mind mapping tool. Thank you, Glenn Thomas, for that one. It's yeah. amazing and it's good for getting your ideas up on a, on a, on a wall. It's worthwhile. Nice, nice mind yeah. map. Mind Node, I think mind it's called. Node. It's just a mind mapping tool, but it's super, yeah. it's pretty elegant. It's nice. Outside of formal education, mate. Any podcast books you like to read? Yeah, so don't listen to podcasts because I, I typically try and try and 
get away from podcasts at work, I can't focus. If I've got someone talking in my ear, I tend to, my brain goes that way versus focusing on the, on, on the task at hand. Yeah. Um, and I'm also a big core believer of unplugging. As much as I love technology, I unplug as much as possible. So I minimize my RF technique. RF at home, my Wi-Fi gets turned off overnight. Phones going going to, going to into airplane modes and things. Turn the power off once a month for no no electromagnetic radiation. So part of that downtime is is, is reading some books, right? So um, they try and disconnect and, and unplug. So I've got some 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 cool books here that I do see that you've brought some books along for well, the journey yeah. today. Just for, for for the viewers at home, right? So I, I've got I guess a few categories, and these ones here are my core books that sit, sit on rotate, right? And they're from from um, people and understanding teams. Um, and I guess it's the foundation of why I've built such great teams in the past um, and, and as a leader. But um, if you want to read a book about people, Personality Plus, um, understanding the personality types and realizing that the person you're speaking to doesn't need to change, you yourself need to change so that they're, that they're listening to what you're actually trying to communicate. Um, and you gotta do that in different ways depending on their personality. Um, but if you don't understand it, how do you communicate with them? So Key, key book in understanding that there. Um, five love languages. Um, this one's not just about love light. So yeah, it's great for, for partners and, and lovers, but also really good at understanding your team, right? So the concepts there around um, the ways that, that, you, that you can gratify or, or reward your team depends on, on, on how, how they, they perceive that based on their love language. So whether they like high fives, whether they like them to have words of affirmation being spoken to, whether they like just some one-on-one time, taking them out to lunch or taking them out to a coffee um, or, or small little gifts or, or just doing a small task for them. Um, so yeah, understanding how they receive that. Um, so those two books together, you get a really good understanding as how people perceive what you're saying to them. Yeah. Um, and that's been critical to, to, I guess, understanding and, and building the right teams because people clash and you understand why in, 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 a, in a few of those. Um, to then, yeah, my, what, one of my, my favorite books, um, the slight edge effect, right? Um, if if you're not moving forwards, you're moving backwards. There, there, there is no concept of uh, of staying stable. And I, I love change. Um, change is the best thing. So I guess why maybe I like technology. Um, changing so fast. Yeah. I hate being being stagnant. I hate being in in, in similar positions. Like I'm always moving fast. It's I, I guess a, a really good yeah uh, virtue, but also a very negative virtue. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't get bored easily, but I but I like I like the right. differences. Um, and this kind of outlines and explains quite well what, what, why that's the case and why I like change, right? If you're sitting still, you, you, you're going backwards. So how, how do I always increase and drive to, to better myself, better my team, better better anything I'm trying to do um, is kind of based on the on the principles of the side edge effect. Yeah, nice. We've got a couple of others there. What else have we got? Oh, seven habits of highly, highly successful people. Um, the secret, the definitive book of, uh, of body language. Um, so I did a course with, um, with, with Alan Peace a few years ago. Um, so he's world renowned. He, he writes most of the pre- the president's speeches and how they should be. So not just the, 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 the verbal speech, but also their physical speech yeah. of how and when they should be using their hands, their body language, who they're pointing to and talking to. Um, so that's, that's a good book too. Um, really good for salespeople to understand um, how they're being perceived and, and, and how to close deals. Uh, but still, still, still a good book to understand when someone doesn't want to actually be speaking to you right now when they're trying to, to get away. Yeah. Um, so good book. And one of my favorite entrepreneurial books, you only have to be right once. That's true. Um, there, there's many successful people out there um, that, yeah, they're, they're, they're successful. Um, could, could they repeat that success? Maybe, maybe not, but who cares? You only have to be right once. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those people haven't only tried once, right? A lot of those people have a lot of failures behind them, but it's that you keep on trying, you try exactly. things. Just keep, just keep driving. From episode 19, Josh Peake. From a, I guess a further educational perspective outside of the training we've done, is there any, you've mentioned audio books, you try to listen to 80 years, is, it, um, mate, is there any other hardcore books or? Or, or audiobooks that you've listened to lately that you'd highly recommend? So there's one book I've been pushing onto my team called The Phoenix Project. Yeah. And it's based on another book called The Goal, where they take like lean manufacturing and the lean startup sort of methodology, which is essentially the scientific method. I have a hypothesis, I'm going to test it, and I iterate on that, and you have a feedback loop, and you close it. 
But the way they've applied it is to an IT environment. And as a knowledge worker, you have a lot of invisible work in progress. And the way they've written the story is first person. So you follow around this guy called Bill in an IT department and everything's on fire and he's trying to recover the business. And it's really good in the audiobook form because the voice acting is superb. Yeah. But I've been pushing it onto my team because I've read it twice now. Other companies I've worked at, multiple uh, colleagues have also read it and loved it. So I've got a, a bet going with my team. If you read it and you get nothing out of it, I will give you $100 for your time. That's how strongly I recommend it. So nice. What was that called again? It's called The Phoenix Project. Do you know who it was by? Ooh, there's three authors. Okay, we'll link that up in the yeah. show notes anyway. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to find it. That'll be uh, an interesting one. That's good. That's good to get a highly recommended book like that, right? That's one that you can, you can go, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll put my own dollars on that. But of course, if they don't get anything out of it, it's like, all right, fair enough, I'll pay for that. But I can guarantee yeah. that I'll have better colleagues for them understanding what the idea is of planned and unplanned work and invisible work and being on top of that because there's so many like subtle issues when you're just focused on solving your immediate problem and not looking at the whole project. Yeah. Outside of audiobooks then, um, Twitter, anywhere, Twitter, do you follow anyone on Twitter? Are you following blogs or anything that you'd recommend for people to say, hey, you should definitely follow this or you should definitely be a subscriber to XYZ? So there's a website called realpython.com. Yep. So I follow that and the guy that runs that, Dan Bader, he's a bit of a luminary in the Python ecosystem. He does a drip email feed thing where He'll send out once a week a little snippet like, did you know you can do this in Python? But also he links to their blogs on, it's a decent sized article. So here's a feature of Python. Go deep on it or as little or shallow as you want on it. Yeah. So they're really awesome. It's very high quality. And I was working on a Python project a few years ago, had a few years away from it. And now Komatsu is very Python heavy. So I had to do like a two year catch up. So Real Python was awesome for that. And there's a few podcasts that listen to a two-year backlog of podcasts. And I get that historical catch-up as well. As yeah, like, what's happening yeah. in the industry? Nice. What are the podcasts of choice? Uh, that was Talk Python to Me and Python Bytes. That is a lot of Python catching up, man. Yes. Talking a couple of podcasts. Uh, I mean, as I said, that's, that's one of those things, investing in yourself, investing in time. Uh, it's, it just doesn't come by chance. Before coming in, I checked how many podcasts I listen to. It's like 15 a week. I listen to yeah, right. but that's because whenever I'm mowing the lawn doing the ironing washing the car yeah. um, the housework like my wife's happier that I'm doing it but like that's my go-to time to catch up on podcasts so I smash your fair bit of content yeah nice any other podcasts you'd recommend outside of that to people oh, there's a really good one called No Such Thing as a Fish yeah it's not a technical one it's just a whole bunch of fun facts told by all British comedians so yeah nice that's cool to break it up from episode 20 Ryan Stevenson yeah, that's been a big personal lesson for me. In terms of tools, I'm a bit of a Google fanboy and I've been using Google Keep recently yeah. to manage um, what I'm doing at work. I can keep multiple... It, it's slightly more sophisticated than just a standard to-do list. Yeah. I can keep multiple lists. I can have subsets. and yeah. um, I can link in um, to Google Docs. I can um, have links into um, emails and things like that. So I've been using Google Keep a lot recently to just organize my thoughts yeah. and um, it's that thing where, where you know if a thought pops into your head that you need to do something or you can just I can just get my phone out and phone down. put it in there and it's at my desktop next time I'm there yeah. so I'm finding Google Keep pretty useful and um, I've been trying but with mixed success the um, the Pomodoro technique for yeah. trying to organize my day you know this yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, tried, I've got the app on my phone right, I think yeah. it's been opened about a half dozen times yeah. I have you know, I'll listen to a podcast or I'll read a book and, and or listen, listen to an audio book and they're like, oh, yeah, this is the way to go. Yeah. I'm like, oh, definitely. Okay, I've got to get into this. I'm, I'm trying to get out of the, the multitasking and get into the more focused approaches. Yes. So I think one of my problems in the past is just different different things coming at me and I'm like, oh, a bit of this, a bit of that. Or I'm trying to go, you know, mm. um, focused area, 20 minutes, boom, in this zone, um, mm. tick, tick that box. Uh, I've had... I wouldn't say I'm successful at it at the moment. No, um, me either. <laughs> it's I, a work in progress. Yeah, it, it definitely. It, I, I can definitely see the benefits. And really, it shouldn't be too difficult. It, it really shouldn't be too difficult to, you know, to, to section out a half an hour block and, and be, you know, 25 minutes of this is, is really, you know, 
concentrated time. Yeah. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um, I have found it difficult though. Um, I think that's just, that's, you've just got to train yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that technique suits some types of work that you need to get through and it doesn't fit quite so well for other things yeah. where, where you've got to make a bunch of calls or things like that. So it kind of gets disrupted and then I lose the flow. But oh, I don't know exactly the exact same. You know, I call, up, even if I'm making calls for that 25 minutes, that you know, one call changes the direction which leads sure. to another task, which yeah. and I end up down a rabbit hole. Yep, yep. Um, but I, I, I definitely see the the benefits of it. So there's uh, there's probably three tips I, I guess we can share with the listeners. Is there any, any other software tools or anything you guys, you, you obviously mentioned Jira before, um, but that's probably more so for the actual the actual dev team. Um, yes, we use, um, on the non-technical side, we do use Jira because yeah. it's there, it's available to yeah. us. We use it for some other things like um, um, uh, travel requests, um, tasking. Yeah. Um, so uh, we put together travel itineraries and uh, put together costings and then have them approved and we use the Jira system Jira system to track all that yeah. um, we use Confluence yeah. um, as a, a sort of living knowledge repository and that's useful for me on the legal side yeah. so we have a legal resources space in Confluence yeah. where I can put up a lot of um, information that deals with frequently asked questions or um, standard template documents are made available yeah. Um, in the Confluence, um, in our legal space on Confluence. So yep. we, we use that tool. I've, I've just recently discovered Slack. So the technical side of the business has been using Slack for a while. Yeah. And I've, uh, I'm about three weeks into using Slack. So that looks interesting. It's got some, some possibilities. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, and it's probably that consistency again, right? It's, if everyone's in there and everyone's using it, it's, sure. it's, it's, it's you know, really valuable. Yeah. So there's a mix between that and email and everything else that it can become another tool, right? Yeah, that, and that's a danger in a tech business where, where for every problem you reach for a tech solution, you end up with this dog's breakfast of, oh, we'll use email for that, we're using Slack for that, we're using Skype for that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Very difficult, right? Yeah. From episode 21, Jeremy Gupta. Do you have any productivity tools and software that you use on a daily basis to you know, get you through the day? Um, I do. Uh, I, I quite like lists, um, so short-term lists, long-term lists, yeah. um, which I segment into the kind of personal and professional lives. Um, I don't you know, have any purchase software. I use Apple Notes, yeah. um, but I find it you know, particularly useful having a set of things that you want to achieve in a given time period. Um, so I have one for a day and, and one for a week, um, and I have some longer-term things which I kind of bring in you know, when there's time and availability to do that. Sure. Um, you know, I have... Yeah, some pretty big things as well that you know I probably want to achieve, and I'm a big believer in that. You probably overcook what you think you can achieve in one year, but yeah, you underplay what you can achieve in three years. Yeah. So you know, having kind of a horizon of where you want to be um, and what you want to do and what you want to achieve at a three-year horizon, I think is hugely beneficial because uh, you'll find you probably can. Um, so yeah, I don't use anything too fancy in terms of tooling, but I find like short lists um, that keep you focused, and you know, you can kind of. Celebrate the wins when you get through that list. Um, hugely beneficial for progress. From episode 22, Jonathan Hooker. Hey, where, where are you getting your learnings at the moment? Um, where is it, is it reading books? Is it, is it attending a formal education? Is it having discussions with smart people? Where has this come from for you? Yeah, well, it's, you know when people say you go down the rabbit hole? Yep. Ugh. It's down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So what happens is you usually, you start with a friend and they ask you some questions and you don't know those answers. And then you upskill yourself and then suddenly you leave it for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually did this with a friend that owns a big VC firm in, in Europe. So we sat in a pub in England and we talked about the Bitcoin paper. This was years ago. And he asked me some questions about blockchain. And I was a techie and I didn't know and it annoyed me. So I went away, learned some stuff, went back to him. And then I, it was probably a year later, I started to ask more and more questions. Yeah. And the key thing is there is nobody, it, I, I read a lot. I say that, I actually podcast. What I do is I take them and I go for long walks along the beach and let the speakers speak it to me because yeah. it's complex, like blockchain, IoT, AI. <clears throat> A decentralized companies are really complex because it's game theory, economics, technology, all into one. Uh, so I have to read it quite a few times to really 
piece together all the parts of what's happening. Uh, so yeah, um, anything, uh, there's a few, I, I read, I, I listen to a lot of economics and monetary podcasts because they're the, probably the weakest because I never had that education. Uh, but with tech, I, any white paper, uh, outlier ventures in Europe's really good. Uh, just read all their research. Um, yeah, anything that I can, any papers basically. So if you could point people in two or three directions for for education, where would you where would you start for our listeners if we could link them up in um, show notes? I would read every word Outlier Ventures has got on research and every company that they've invested in. <clears throat> that would take you six months. So just do that, yeah. and then you'll be you'll be ready to rock. Yeah, nice. From a productivity standpoint or a project standpoint, how do you sort of manage your, your day? Find it a little bit more difficult these days. So, uh, so the Kanban or your Jira board or uh, Tuki Ono, Tuki Ono, he's, I can never get his name right. Uh, Toyota, Kanban, the boards, swim lanes, doesn't really matter. Uh, anyway, so you used to break up your projects and a lot of that stuff was it was done for you yeah. um, just by turning up and going through your ceremonies and doing that. Uh, if I ever wanted to know what my next task was, I would head over to the to-do column. Yeah. Um, I don't have as much of that. I'm a lot more self-governed. Uh, so uh, getting stuff done... Um, we're getting things done. Uh, David. Getting was, stuff done. Getting stuff done. GTD. Getting things done. Getting things, yeah. That's stuff. Yeah. Getting things done. Yeah. yeah. So I, I subscribe to that a lot. So lists, yeah. big into lists, whether you want to use Trello boards, Jira boards, Google list, uh, little post it, snag it, sort of note on your desktop, however you want to do. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm big on lists. I'm big on I can file it. And I know if I put it in that list, I will get back to it. And I'll come and I'll reprioritize it and I'll see how it goes. So I think for me, whatever tool floats your boat, whatever one works best for you, go with. Yeah. But I think the, yeah, getting things done, uh, if you haven't looked into any of that, Google that. Um, I did and, down that path at one stage. It was a pretty deep path. It does get rather deep and obviously he gets, uh, he gets right into it. Yeah. I think if you just look at, well, for me, what I took from that, like any advice, you're gonna get advice from everyone, you gotta pick what works for you. Yeah. Uh, so I looked at that and the things, main things I took out of that would be um, put things in a list yeah. and make sure you go back to that list, you reprioritize that list and you, you can't put half your day on it and then forget the other half. You gotta be pretty religious in doing that. Um, so yeah, that's probably my biggest productivity tip yeah. for anyone that's, that's self-managing. I think a, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the time where I've worked, I've worked in a scrum team yeah. and you sit down, you do sprint planning, that plan that literally plans out your week for two weeks and the fundamentals are if you're working on things that aren't on that board, you're working on the wrong thing. How so, did you learn to do this in your own time then? How, how uh, self-educated? Um, yeah, so dad um, kind of taught himself when he got the computer. He modified a few games to be maths questions rather before you can do something. Yeah. Um, so dad helped a bit, um, plus the internet, I guess, tutorials and that kind of thing. Site point back in the day in the high school years for all the um, yeah, PHP, MySQL, all that kind of stuff. But it's really cool kind of seeing, um, I guess, how much, how many resources are available now for learning all that kind of thing, like Stack Overflow and like the, um, yeah, it used to take hours of kind of debugging something or um, trying to reverse engineer something um, and how easy it is to find answers to problems these days is, is, is pretty cool. From episode 25, Robert Lang. One of the questions you'd sent through was what is your one productivity tool? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought if I could only have one, it would have to be the G Suite, yep. right? Because well, I've got Gmail, I've got Google Docs, I've got yep. Google Sheets, I've got everything I need there. It's not very sexy in terms of one tool, but it's the tool I spend the most time in probably. Yeah. Um, I try to manage my day through a fairly well-known by now principle, which is called uh, GTD, which is getting things done or, yep. and linked to Inbox Zero. Yeah. So I have my Gmail configured so that I can organize my emails 
um, get my inbox to zero, organize my emails into a GTD kind of a process. Mm. I quite often fall off the wagon and have to clean things up. Um, but that's how I try to manage my time. So I use various tools. I use a tool called Todoist at the moment yeah. for my to-do lists. One tool that I have been experimenting with at the last couple of roles, which works quite well, is a, a virtual assistant, yeah. which I use one called x.ai. x.ai. So it's, um, it's URL. Yeah. Um, and you get given, so when you sign up, you pay something like 10 bucks a month. Yeah. And you get assigned an AI assistant who manages your calendar and is linked into the calendar. Yeah. So you literally just copy. So you can either have Amy or Andrew, depending on your preference. So I have Amy. And if someone says to me, hey, Rob, can we catch up next week um, for a bit of a chat? Just need an hour of your time. Mm-hmm. I can reply and say, sure thing, Amy copy Amy into the thing and then say, Amy, can you find a time for us to meet? And what's cool about it is the AI assistant interacts with the person until a time is resolved. So they can propose, you know, Rob has Thursday afternoon available. That person can respond back saying, no, I'm busy, but I can do Friday. Then they can say, how about Friday 2 p.m.? That person can say, sounds good. Then they send the calendar invites. Perfect. So they handle all that sort of stuff. And and I was a bit skeptical, but I definitely wanted to play with it when I first heard about it. Yeah, right. Uh, and I've had few hiccups, you know, like 99% of the time. That's right. The, it just gets sorted and organized. And I've even had friends joke back, you know, Amy is super efficient, yeah. you, know, like, you know, and full well knowing that it's AI. Yeah. Um, so that's one cool thing that I've been playing with. And that's, it's amazing how much time that saves. Mm. And, and I never had, so far, I've, I've been using it for two years, I've never had anyone have any negative response to it. I, I had people when I first proposed it actually theorize that it was kind of negative. Isn't that a bit impersonal? You're handing off to an AI assistant. Well, but when I've worked at big corporations, I've had a personal assistant yeah. uh, and he or she would organize my calendar. So yeah. this is just an AI doing it. Yeah. But, but I was expecting some people to say, it's a bit rude, you hooking me off to an AI. Yeah. But as I said, I haven't had anyone, at, at least verbally, tell me. Is there any anywhere that you'd point people from an educational perspective? Um, from a, if it's particularly around data and analytics, I've filled in some small gaps, I guess, over the years um, from Data Camp is a good site. Yeah. So four or five years ago, it was probably one of the one of the big ones or one of the only ones that. But now um, there's probably a lot more. I found early on Kaggle was good. It's a website where it, they People can post competitions for predictive modeling. So mm-hmm. a company or someone might post a data set and you have to train a model on that data set and then score some sample data and they basically have leaderboards. And that's a good website because A, you get to learn on some real data. You have some chance of winning a competition, although these days the professionals with a lot of experience tend to win them. Yeah. Um, but you also get a lot of the people in that community are, are really good at sharing what they know. So you'll often see people who won a competition yeah. that maybe you had a try at winning yeah. um, will then go and post the code that they wrote to get the winning entry and you might learn something each time about a new technique for maybe the way you prepared the data or some of the parameters oh, you nice. use. So it's kind of good, nice little feedback loop. You get to be a part of a competition a little bit of gamification in there always helps, right? Like, yeah, you, know, you get that more and more in learning, in, you know, yeah. learning providers as well. Like, even as things as basic as badges, right? Badges yeah. for different things you've done, but through sort of you know, genuine competitions like that. Yeah. What's well, from a productivity perspective? How do you operate? Is there a productivity tool that you use? Well, I should, yeah, uh, I certainly have a productivity tool it's my cto craig williams <laughs> hello craig <laughs> that's a bit rude calling me a productivity tool no but yeah so uh in the first couple of years starting everything i mean i started as a one-man show i did everything yeah. i did everything poorly yeah and i remain an amateur in a wide range of of areas uh professionally now we have structure we have a cto uh who's supremely experienced in running teams and he's, building software. He's definitely got some strengths there. He's yes, ab- absolutely. So, um, you know, so I've, I've been able to bring that structure in and, uh, um, 
and run it. So I don't take so much of a role in the day-to-day development, you know, in terms of grooming the backlog, yeah. planning sprints, that kind of stuff. Speaking specifically about tools, um, we run Slack because I think ASIC finds you now if you don't run Slack. Or something, <laughs> right? so, no, yeah, Slack obviously is ubiquitous. It's, it's super useful. Um, Jira, again, we're a software company. Um, people will laugh at you if you don't use Atlassian products. Personally, uh, Todoist, yeah. um, just a you know, to-do checklist. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how I um, keep myself focused um, mm-hmm. by you know, fulfilling a list of tasks, prioritizing them, and just smashing through them. Uh, yeah. Pretty, uh, I've been accused in the past of being disorganized and uh, uh, having a pretty chaotic style. Interesting. Actually, one thing you mentioned about mentorship, uh, you know, I've like recently, uh, you know, spoken to, uh, you know, one of the persons who's kind of become my mentor. And I would actually recommend that. I think you were asking before about what your recommendation would be, like moving from the senior engineer to, so I guess, head of tech, senior uh, CTO level. Um, I would definitely recommend getting a mentor who's gone through that, mm. gone through that process. And that that's helped me. Uh, I mentioned some of the things he's he's taught me. I've started to implement now, like you know, getting off coding, stop touching code, get get at a high level. Um, you know, read some interesting books like the hard thing about hard things. Um, yeah, he suggested the high output management. So there's a lot of kind of management books that. Uh, My hard thing about hard things is a great book. I was, yeah, I I, I no one cliche couldn't put it down, but that was that was one of the books that I I pushed through pretty quickly. I was yeah. Uh, quite engaging yeah it was uh, and i think uh oh like i like the the fact that it was it was more there's no real plan yeah you know to to, to running business there's a whole bunch of plans obviously but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do to get through it it's just um, real that was it's that real. was the other thing because um yeah i've read a lot of management and a lot of uh you know other type of educational books and theories are fantastic, yeah. right? Um, and it's and it's it's really good to have some base concepts yeah. that you can you know lean on. But it's also really interesting to hear from someone that's gone through it, mm. and it's not a straight line. Yeah, um, no, it's uh, definitely not. Uh, things are difficult. People make mistakes. Even the most successful people, like yeah. you, made significant mistakes yeah. throughout that process, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, could have things been an easier ride? Definitely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the end, they've had a, you know, a wealth of success. But yeah. Uh, it also gives people, oh, it gave me insights and uh, probably just confidence that, you know, we all have our, our good days and our other days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll make good decisions and bad. Is there any productivity tools you use? Is there any anything that you yeah. find really interesting? That So I think probably my new favorite thing is Miro, or it used to be called Real Time Boards. And it's a really great way because a lot of what I try to do is make make problems visual, um, so or make solutions visual. So it's you know um, looking at current state, making journey maps, or you know if I'm in a meeting with a bunch of stakeholders, almost mapping out the relationships between them all and what they're working on, so I can look at it later and be like, okay, that person and that person, I need to talk to them about X. Um, rather than going through a page of notes, it's all visual. So with Miro, it's it's cloud-based, so I can share it with people as well, and I can we can be working on it together, you know, f- remotely. So that's that's been great because I can just you know flick flick a link to someone and be like, here's here's what I'm imagining this should be, or here's my stakeholder map, and you, this might help you. So that's been really good um, for collaboration, which is a lot of what I do. Nice. Um, so I love Miro boards. And we'll link that up in the show notes because yeah. I think that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's it's basically like a big virtual whiteboard. Yeah. So, and you can do kind of anything with it. I've seen people use it for um, product maps or, yeah, I use it a lot for journey maps, but, yeah, mind maps and brainstorming and, yeah, it's great. Um, the other thing I use it a lot is Trello. I think that's yeah. probably a well-known tool. Yeah, it's very versatile and, again, you can collaborate. We use it for, strangely enough, for research. We use it for research documentation and um, so 
back in the back in the day, okay. um, we would put post-it notes on the wall and do affinity mapping where you're grouping like with like together. Yeah. And that's how we do our research analysis. And we at some point we were like, well, let's try this in Trello. And we started to do the same thing. So it's digitized and it's just there and you don't have to worry about having a wall because finding a free wall is like finding gold. Um, and so you can do it digitally. You can do it remotely. Um, you can all be sitting at your computers doing it. It's maybe not as much fun, yeah. but it's quite effective. So, yeah, Trello has been a really good tool for all sorts of things. But the research analysis was a surprise. The surprise use. Yeah. yeah, saving the rainforest. Eh? I've seen that. Yeah, true. That too. <laughs> those different coloured post-it notes. I've been in one or two of those uh, meetings before. Mm. And all the different coloured post-it notes on the wall. Yeah. Which is, as you said, there sometimes there are some advantages of having people in a room and and doing it together. But yeah. hey, it's not always it's not always applicable. You can't always get everyone together. No. So if there's a, yeah. a way to do that and have people remotely all working together. Yeah, and for some of the research pieces we've done, you would have like you know thousands of post-it notes. Yeah. Based on the, how many Trello cards we've had, so yeah, yeah it's it's good. Yeah, yeah. And, and somebody has to document that all at the end of the day as well, right? So yeah. Having yeah. all done, done Trello, it's all it's there. It's all in Trello. It's, you're just cutting a step, which is good. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Yeah. Anything else you, you use on a daily basis? Oh, just probably some graphic design tools. I use, use, I've used Sketch and I've, I use Illustrator a fair bit more yeah. in my service design role than I did with UX. Yeah. UX, we use Sketch a lot. But um, I think because I'm, I'm probably illustrating more things these days, which is odd i'm using some of my design skills probably more than i used to yeah, right. which was a surprise yeah yeah so yeah design tools to, to i guess to visualize things to share with people and sometimes that's yeah amusing. well that's half the battle sometimes really is like trying to communicate what you're talking about right and if you can if you know through an illustration is a yeah. easy way to do it yeah battle. and i think trying to communicate so if we do a research piece of like here's what the customer is experiencing so this is the problem we're trying to solve being able to communicate that with um you know even just really basic forms of illustration you can communicate emotion and feelings and so that creates empathy with the people that you're talking to and that's again half the battle like to get them to understand the journey that the members are going through and empathize with them that's really powerful The best thing about productivity is the less amount of time you have, the more you like to get something done, you'll just get it done faster. So I've just am super efficient with with what I've got to get done and have a few days to do it. Um, But yeah, look, I I also manage it in the sense that my freelance is built off a few key relationships. So that means that it's probably not as overwhelming as it sounds. So I know kind of who I'm dealing with and where stuff's coming from and that sort of thing. So yeah. And you spoke about your mutual distaste on to do lists with Colin before. Yeah, to do list apps. Yeah. yeah, Have you found anything that (laughs) ticks your box? Yeah, uh, not quite. Like I, I, I still have my version of a to-do app in my head that I want to make and I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, so it'll come out. Um, there's things that do parts of what I want to do, but they don't all do it. Not that mine won't be that good, I don't know, but I just want it. Um, but I use uh, Notion. That has been a lifesaver. Notion, Notion? Notion.so, which is a new app, so a new unicorn that yeah. <laughs> you know everyone can have a look at. But, um, yeah, it is a... Uh, wiki so it's like it's like an evernote but right. but it's um more markup based like a lot simpler but just a lot more powerful really simple like yeah like it's free for ages which is great i, I pay for it but yeah it's a great app i collect everything that i do in it i, I you know i put it evernote into it it has an extraction for that but i you know so if anyone out there is using evernote which i am which you are then have a look at notion because evernote's good not bad but uh Notion is just so good <laughs> from a pure note taking perspective. Yeah, just notes, a bit everything. Like, I mean, you know, I embed, you can embed everything. So, Notion is where I collected all that design uh, system stuff for Social Pinpoint. And then, because you get a live link for that page, you can, it's like making mini websites. I mean, it is a wiki product. Yeah. You make wikis in it, but you can, yeah, you can just do a page or you connect them or, you know, so it's really flexible. I do all my personal stuff in it and all my client work. So, when you do a UI with me or some other work, I actually, create a page for us and I put stuff in there and explain stuff and I have images and explanations and it's like a little wiki of the work. It's not in email All right. anymore. So it actually takes me out of email and out of my other note taking up. It's phenomenal. <laughs> that is a big wrap. It's very good. You should yes. become a salesperson. Yeah, well, uh, yeah.
Hey, if you can sell brand sync as well as <laughs> yeah, I should. Yeah, yeah, I'll work on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our product isn't as compelling. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Notion, it's very good. That's awesome. what I stay on top of. Things. Awesome. You're pretty educated, dude. You're uh, you've obviously built a piece of software. Informally. Um, yeah, informally, formally, yeah. <laughs> education, yeah. Uh, <laughs> mate. You 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 know your stuff. Let's put it that way. Where do you do your learning? Um, well. Online, so like, like any good nerd, I have a good feed of things that I've culled down to follow a few websites. Yep. Um, nice. But mostly, re- like reading has been a, a big place. Like, I just, well, that's why right. let's start with those few websites. Where do you go? Well, it's a bit of a collection of a few design ones and some just for. I, there's no single one. Like, you know, places like Web Designer Depot and some really big ones that people know. Like, I stay on top of those and um, uh, CSS tricks, places like that. Um, but those things in aggregate really like I just sort of watch what's happening on those and pick up um, yeah tips and tricks through them and otherwise like yeah I actually prefer to look at that much design stuff but yeah I, I read like a lot of non-fiction which I find really helpful so I'm actually a little bit um yeah out, out of scope uh, out of hands off on the design space just because I you know find it um, not useful yeah um, so I look for other places to learn really like I, I've gotten a lot into um uh, behavioral economics, um, like so, like the free economics podcast is really good. Yeah. Um, that side of things because that's you know money and psychology smashed together. So that's a really good like um, it's like yeah, you know, it's just business, yeah. <laughs> right? But also design. Design is like me visually communicating something to you, but also like emotionally and, and, and basically trying to manipulate you into some sort of feeling about it right so that's I'm so talking that's, behavior that's psychology it's all psychology it's all those bits so like i try and um yeah i like to read about other things i find it all feeds each other so um that's why you know you design then you code a bit and then you do some other things i do a bit of video editing and animation and, and try and pick up all those bits at least a little bit yeah and then and then feed them all back together see what you know that's good. yeah so but yeah i just read the non-fiction a lot and then um, i'm reading my personal mba at the moment which is amazing um what's that just yeah my, like it, it's just a book that summarizes an entire mba into like you know a, an absorbable part but it's just really succinct amazing yeah. can't remember who wrote it i'm sort of 70 percent through at the moment so i haven't like turned back to the cover yet but um, <laughs> yeah i can't remember his name but it, it's very it's quite famous it's been yeah. around for a long time um andrew gave it to me and said you should read this and i was like two pages in. it's it's, it's amazing so um because i don't have any business uh education apart from just being around sort of other businesses and startups and design agencies are an interesting place to get business experience because we've helped we help lots of clients do stuff and so we get to know about them and their business and what they're doing especially when you help a startup yeah um so looking from the outside in has been really interesting Uh, so you guys both obviously really busy working full-time jobs and then running this side business some productivity tools how do you get this done what's let's let's start with nick so i guess yeah there's not a lot of time after i get home from a full day of work so for me Productivity is about having a really clear idea about what I need to actually do, something you know, smaller modular that I can accomplish. So I don't have a lot of time to procrastinate or, or muck around. So I um, I use a, a an agile board. It makes it really clear what's front and center needs to be done. I have a pretty reliable, fast laptop. You know, you don't want to be if you're waiting for something slow, you start to get distracted. It gives you excuses to not get work done. Um, another thing for me as a as a developer, I um, need to make sure my environment is pretty well configured because. If I start pulling down the latest code and and it's and my environment's broken for whatever reason, which just happens sometimes, I like to know that. So I use um I use Docker and and um, Ansible at the moment. Yeah. Um, it just seems to work for me. So that just allows me to containerize my environment and and I have a well-defined configuration. Yeah. And so that means I can you know fire up my application and, and it works and I can write my code and, and test it. And there's there's not a lot of mucking around. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, great stuff, man. Um, I think for me, yeah, Docker and Ansible are, are great tools. Um, I can go and break a system and leave it in a weird state and just go, no, nah, get rid of it, start again, clean fresh. Yeah. It's easy. Also, keeping the wiki, um, we yeah. keep some of the documents around that we can, um, you yeah. know, keep track of different things that we, yeah, especially since we follow things like that. It's because we've we opened quite a few different products, you know, with all our customers. So yeah. Keeping a, you know, a wiki really helps. Refresh the memory, basically. Yeah, no, nice. Link things differently. And you guys both contribute to that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. Very nice. Any other tools you use, Matt? 
from a productivity perspective. From a productivity um it depends, it depends how like production you want to be okay. yeah. practice testing, right? We use yeah, like, um, Metasploit, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So there's in terms of hacking tools, you know, you can use tools like Search Deploit. Um, it's basically a database of um, common vulnerabilities. You can go use that and use Metasploit to exploit those those vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, there's tools like OWASP Zap that just automatically go and try out the top ten most common vulnerabilities on your website. Yeah, right. Um, so it'll speed that that sort of process up a bit. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah things like that. Yeah. Nice. And then you guys obviously both learned this um, as you went, you both did the Chelsea, um, you know, course on top of your degrees. Any other forms of education that you've said, whether it be a book or a podcast that you really recommend to people that might have an interest in growing their, you know, their knowledge around security? So I've done a couple of Coursera courses as well. Yeah. Um, definitely a good Coursera. They've got a few things around. Um, listen to a lot of audio books. Yeah. Um, things like um, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Yeah. A really good book. Um, yeah. Lean Startup. Yeah. Eric um, Price. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Ten X Rule. Ten X by yeah. um, Grant Cardone. That was, yeah. That was a really good one. Um, I, I think a lot of mine are geared more towards the business and leadership. Yeah. Any others on top of those three that you'd mentioned? I found really valuable if you're if you're into business. The um the personal MBA was um, oh, yeah. pretty good. It's, it's basically like a full MBA. Yeah. Type course compressed into a 13 hour audio book. Yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah. It's good, uh, good fundamental stuff. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I could put myself through an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I know some people that have, and touche to anyone that has, because uh, there's some definite hours put into that. From a productivity perspective, any tools you use, any theories, any any way of doing things to manage your day, manage your workload? So I'm a big, big fan of, I've tried everyone. Like, like I'm a, a, a what do they call it? A, um, a, a master of none. Like yeah. I, I'm just try everything. Um, so I've tried online, I, you know, that we, we actually use Trello in the office for, to, for project management stuff. Um, like particular events and, and projects that we're working on. But I've tried them all, Asana, like every single one of them. And um, the only thing I find works really well is writing things down. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of bullet journaling, yeah. um, massive advocate for that. And, in fact, I've really fallen off the wagon with bullet journaling over the last month or so and I'm really feeling it. Yeah. So um, it doesn't take much to get back into it and do it right. Um, but, man, it makes such a difference to my day. I just find writing and ticking, yep. um, just a very rewarding and yeah. helpful way. And I to think everyone remembers things differently as well, right? And a lot of people, I think you're right. A lot of people that that act of writing things down makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, from an educational perspective, any any books you'd recommend to people? Um, well, talking about um, interesting pathways to getting to where you are, I just finished reading a book called Educated by Tara Westoff. Yeah. She's got a really unique upbringing, a story to tell in her upbringing, um, but it talks about the power of education and, 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 and what impact it can have on your worldview yeah. and the relationships you build as a result of it, particularly with your family. Yeah. It was like, like I, I've never sat down and read a book like, like a biogra an autobiography like that in two days. Like I just could wow. not put it down. It was the most fascinating story, so I highly recommend that. We'll, um, we'll link that up in the podcast. Yeah, and then um, what else am I? Oh, okay. So I was just at a conference in. Um, uh, for, it's called the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers Conference. It happens every year somewhere in the world, and this year it was in Europe. And the keynote speaker was ha uh, Hans Rosling's son. I should know his first name, but I can't think of what it is. Uh, he's a big data visualization specialist, so yep. he's done a couple of TED Talks as well. And he uh, started a company called Gapminder, which is about how do you use information to present real-world facts. Um and uh, so what they have done is developed this website called gapminder.org and you go on it and it provides you with, um, I think, 12 questions that you have to answer. So, for an example, one is um, scientists um, agree that uh, temperatures on Earth will either rise, decline or stay the same over the, in the future. So you pick which one, right? Um, so it's, it's questions around perceptions around society and how we're performing. 
and it gives you your answers at the end, how wrong or right you are. And what's really interesting in the research that they've done around people's responses, particularly if you get people as a cohort to respond, so they've yeah. had like Nobel laureates as one group respond to these questions. No one's gotten all 12 right. And whether you break it up by country or by age or by job, um, you can, it really tells like all, a lot of the, it really gives you a, an idea of where people are getting their information from and how wrong they are yeah, about wow. their perceptions around what's actually happening in the world. Yep. And I would highly recommend people going and doing this um, and keep doing it until you get all 12 right because you do get a little certificate at the end. Yeah, wow. But what it does is it sets your worldview correctly. Yeah. You know, so whatever perceptions you have about there being a de developing countries and developed countries, that paradigm doesn't exist anymore. There's four stages and the majority of people in the world are in the two middle ones. Yeah, wow. So it's very rare that people are in extreme poverty and very rare that you're in stream, extreme wealth. Um, so the huge market opportunities that are available um, in the middle class in what we used to call developing countries yeah. is huge now. So China and India is like yeah. massive market potential for technology applications in those markets because they've got money to yeah. spend. So I'd highly recommend going on to uh, oh, get yeah, minded on. I'm going to do that this afternoon. It sounds really good. Like <laughs> so it. they're not like no, no. books, but no. they're good online. Yeah, these are tools. So I will link, we'll link that up, um, and obviously that way people can you know, follow those people as well.